Jerry Budger, and I'm president of the Ward 3 Neighborhood Association, which is sponsoring tonight's forum. We hope it proves enlightening and helps everyone make their choices for mayor and councilors at large. Just a short plug for the association here. On Sunday, we'll be holding our annual meeting in the fairgrounds starting at 1 p.m. We want this to be a great neighborhood party where Ward 3 residents can meet neighbors and reconnect with old friends. We'll have refreshments, music, tours of one of the incredible new barns, a cooking demonstration with samples woven around a short business meeting. Hope you can join us then. Flyers about the annual meeting are available at the table right over there. Tonight's forum has some basic ground rules. We will alternate questions asked by the moderator and questions asked from this audience. Questions must be directed to all candidates. We will not allow personal attacks and questioners will have 30 seconds to ask their question. In the counselor at large race, each candidate will make a two minute opening statement, a one minute closing statement, and have two minutes to answer each question. We will rotate the order in which questions are asked of candidates. Our timekeeper, Fred Zimnock, who's right in the front there, will hold up a piece of paper when there's 30 seconds left and sound a tone when time is up. The mayoral candidates will have three minutes to make an opening statement, two minutes for a closing statement, and two minutes to answer each question. Our moderator this evening, selected by the two mayoral candidates, is Kerry Buckley, the Director of Historic Northampton. So without further ado, I present our moderator, Kerry Buckley. Thank you very much, Jerry. I'm just pleased to be here tonight, and I commend you all coming out on this rainy evening on the first night of the World Series, especially. Um, There's a World Series. <laughs> <laughs> the season is more interesting than the regular season, I have to say. Um, I want to thank uh, the Ward 3 Association for sponsoring this debate. A wonderful neighborhood association, a real model uh, for Northampton. Um, thank the Bridge Street School for, for hosting this event. And I wanted to say, I was uh, walking around the cafeteria before the debate, and I noticed a list of school rules on the wall. And I thought they were very appropriate for a political debate. No pushing and shoving. Everybody take their turn. And when the bell rings, everybody take their seat. That's the most important thing. So, uh, without further ado, uh, very pleased to introduce tonight the candidates uh, for City Council at large, uh, Jesse Adams, MJ Adams Pullen, Bill Dwight, and Michael Jank. Each candidate will have uh, two minutes uh, for opening remarks. And so we'll start with Jesse Adams and rotate down. Thank you, Kerry. My name is Jesse Adams. I'm the proven incumbent in this race. My family moved to Western Massachusetts when I was one year old. I have lived here ever since, and I've been educated locally from grammar school to law school. I live on Main Street, and I practice law on Main Street. My father has, has had a business on Main Street for 30 years. I am deeply rooted here, and I love our community. Four years ago, I was elected to public office as a Forbes Library trustee. Two years ago, I was elected to represent you all as one of the two at-large city councilors. In my first term, I served on six committees, chairing two and vice chairing two more. And when I was running, I made certain promises to you. And I delivered on those promises by supporting the arts and cultures with fresh ideas like Jazz Fest, working towards better government through transparency and reform, carefully scrutinizing our budget to ensure that our spending matches our values and priorities, fighting to maintain quality public education, advocating for the environment, sustainable living, and public health, listening to all points of view, and, in and encouraging respectful, spirited debates. All four candidates here have knowledge about city government. <coughs> Two years ago, I had a lot of knowledge about city government, and tonight, I have a lot more. In fact, I've already served under two administrations. But tonight, I'm here to talk about my experience, values, and vision. I have accomplished a lot and have served the city well in my first term. And tonight, I'd like to ask each and every one of you for one of your two votes for city councilor at large so I can continue working. Thank you. 
evening. Thank you for being here this evening. And thank you uh, to Ward 3 and the Bridge Street School community for hosting this forum. It's been a, a real opportunity for us to come out and to meet with neighbors in these forums and to share who we are and what we're about. My name is MJ Adams Pullen. I am a, a born and raised in this community. Uh, as I like to tell people, I couldn't wait to get out of here as a teenager and I couldn't wait to get back as a mother. I think growing up here, going through the educational uh, experience that I had here through the Northampton Public Schools, uh, being educated locally at UMass Amherst, and then leaving the Valley for a while really gave me a very strong sense of the things that we had here in the Valley that we might have taken for granted. So I was happy to be able to move back here with my family in 1995 and to continue to live and work here and to be part of the community. When I moved back, um, I was working uh, with housing issues and uh, in economic development issues region-wide um, and had the opportunity at a little later point to step in and to become the first staff person for Habitat for Humanity here in uh, Pioneer Valley. Uh, and have had a wonderful opportunity over the last 10 years working in that role to be able to see the good energy and the good things that can come together in this fine community and valley-wide when good people, thoughtful people, engage in conversations about what our future valley should look like. And for that reason, um, I want to step up to the plate and hopefully earn your vote as a, for city councilor at large. Um, I have served on the Board of Public Works for the last couple of years, grappling with issues like the landfill, the Upper Roberts Meadow Dam, the lack of resources we need to uh, maintain adequately our streets, sidewalks, <coughs> bridges, roads. And also, I uh, feel like we're at a very critical point because we're now facing a major change in leadership in the corner office. And I want to share my experience, my knowledge and love of the community, uh, and bring that forward to serve the people of Northampton. Thank you. Is that the alarm? <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs> Uh, very um, my name is Bill Dwight, and uh, I too am also grateful for the opportunity to speak here today. Uh, I'm especially grateful to the Ward 3 Neighborhood Association. Um, the residents of this ward addressed complicated, challenging issues, um, which featured a wide variety of competing interests. And honestly, I think that should serve as a model for us all. You showed us how a community solves problems and flourishes when it gives the choice of, when given the choice of submitting to, to uh, divisiveness or striving towards a solution, you chose to work hard for consensus. You chose the right way. I admire that, and I admire that you never lost sight of the fact that you were all working for the best interests of the entire community. And that, after all was said and done, was exactly what you did and you continue to do. I actually remarked on this several times back when I had a radio show, it seemed so long ago. I also served as a counselor for Ward 1 for eight years. I, I actually am a seasoned veteran. My hair is shorter, my hair is thinner, my skin is thicker. But it's that lesson and that example that I use and will continue to use as my compass. And we have many blessings to count, and so many in fact that sometimes we, really, we don't devote the time to doing that calculate them. And the things that we cherish about Northampton are the fruits of community devotion and engagement that is the envy of many towns throughout the state and I would imagine throughout the country for those people in the country who know about it. And most of the blessings weren't bestowed. They were earned. They didn't just happen. And we have this gift of this place because of generations before us of people committed like us treated with the same care and hope. And people like me moved here because we recognized that the legacy was here. I worry that if we succumb to what separates us, we'll lose the thing most precious to us. We see what happens when government sees the political food fights. And there it's the gone. But in any event, governance stops, politics take over, we lose. Good evening. My name is Michael John. I'm a candidate for uh, Councilor at Large. I'd like to thank the Ward 3 Neighborhood Association for sponsoring tonight's debate. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Phil. Uh, throughout my life, I have chosen jobs that have been service oriented. I honorably served in the U.S. Navy and worked in the food industry for 20 years, mostly in management, 15 of those years with Big Y here in Northampton, where I was trusted on Sundays to manage a multi million dollar store. I currently work as a paraprofessional in the Hampshire Regional School District in Southampton, 
working with children that need just a little help getting their educational needs met. I by no means am working in this education field for fa financial reward, but for our willingness, like so many other educators, to impact the child's future. Educationally, I graduated with honors from the University of Massachusetts Amherst with a concentration in American government studies, and I am currently due to graduate with a master's degree in psychological studies from Cambridge College in January. In the past, I was fortunate to have worked for the Honorable Silvio Conti, where I worked on veterans' issues and where I saw how true citizenship, uh, citizen representation was done. I believe that my past education and my work history speak to my abilities to be your counselor at large. My commitment for this job has not wavered as I have run an honest campaign walking every ward, including this one. I have met with residents, farmers, firefighters, and teachers. I have been the only candidate who has attended every budget meeting and attended countless others. Even though I am not on the council, I have worked on Cahill residence issues with success and have the emails to prove such. I am a different candidate, and as I have not been afraid to challenge the status quo, but still have a willingness to work with others for the betterment of Northampton and its residents. When I am elected, I want to be part of the solution, and you can be sure I will be accessible to work on your concerns. I will be a counselor who openly advocates for citizen input as general deliberation from different points of views allows for better decision making for city entities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll begin with a questioning now. Uh, our first question comes from one of our online submissions. The, the second question will be taken from the audience. Can you speak up on that too? Just one, two, one, two. You're good. All right. Am I good? No. 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 You can pick it up. If you uh, you can move to the microphone. Oh, why don't I do this? You're the pro. You can wing down it if you want. <laughs> you don't want to hear. That. Uh, we're going to begin uh, our first question with one of our online submissions. Uh, the next question we'll take from the audience. We'll rotate uh, the, the, the first question uh, amongst the, uh, the council, the uh, candidates. Uh, the first question we'll start with uh, Jesse Adams, and each uh, each candidate will answer that question, and you'll have two minutes to respond. Uh, the first question: How would you solve the traffic, parking, and drainage issues? must be addressed as part of the Fairgrounds Redevelopment Program. I think all those issues are very important. The fact of the matter is the fairgrounds, wish, the fairgrounds wish to expand over a period of time and what we need to do is make sure that all the residents' concerns are met. Those concerns include noise, traffic, and drainage. We can't go forward until we've heard from the residents and have dealt with all those concerns. In my first term, I've sat on the, I've been the vice chair of the Park and Transportation Commission, and I've been the chair of the Board of Public Works and City Council Conference Committee, so I'm quite familiar with, with the greater issues in the entire city on traffic and, and uh, infrastructure. But specifically with respect to that project, in order for that to go forward, we need to make sure that those three issues are addressed noise, traffic, and drainage. And what I can do is be an advocate for all those people. They can come to me as I've been accessible and responsive in my first term. And if all those are met, then the project may go forward. And um, we're only in the first stage right now. So we have a lot of time to make sure that as the attempts to move forward are, are encountered, that all the issues are addressed. And if re-elected, that's what I'll do. I'll work to addressing to those issues so that the process can't be cast in doubt later. In order to have a good result, we need a good process. A good process involves hearing out all those concerns and making sure that they're mitigated as we move forward. Um, I, too, believe that there are many issues that are at play as we are looking to really capitalize on a pretty unique resource that we have here in our community. We know that as we grow over time, uh, we need to tap every available asset that we have to help generate the commercial activity, the economic activity, that we need to keep this community a very vital community. And the wonderful thing about the fairgrounds and the redevelopment of that is that really harkens to our history, our legacy, 
are very much our interest in preserving the agricultural history and legacy that we have here and moving it forward into the new century. But with that comes challenges. Clearly, they've already started to be identified. The draining, the drainage, clearly an issue for people. The parking, the traffic, noise. And there's a process, and a process that is out there that we have to hold our local officials feet to the fire and make sure that we're addressing <coughs> issues up front, that we're being candid and honest, that we have the best engineering uh, possible to really evaluate the impact of that, and that someone sits on that and makes sure that we're following through and addressing the issues as we move forward in the redevelopment. We know that it's, an it's a development that's going to impact this neighborhood most profoundly. Uh, but we also know that we have a, a very broad and open process that we should continue to use and use early on. As Jesse said, start early in identifying those issues, share your concerns, read the reports, be at the meetings, make your voice known, make your concerns known, and make sure that when the decisions are being made in terms of what's going to happen there, that your concerns have been adequately addressed. The, I, I think when the question's phrase is essentially what will I do, I think it is more important, actually, and not trying to dodge the question, but what we will do. I mean, that's essentially what's required. I, even if I'm elected, I don't wield the power to make things so. Or we do as counselors at large, as we, or counselors in any capacity, serve as liaisons and facilitators and mediators and to promote the conversation that, that you just heard described. We need to have the conversation. We need to have, and, and, and as I said in my opening remarks, this community has proven that they're the hallmark, essentially, by my reckoning, how to go about that. You can have disparate needs, and you can have challenges, and you can address them, not, not always quietly, but the fact is you can address them when, you, when the main objective is to focus on the best possible outcome, and that is improving the lot of the city of Northampton, improving upon uh, an antique fairground that, that I believe is the oldest continuous running fair in the country, that to improve on a neighborhood and to and accommodate all the concerns. And those are always addressed in the course of the process. It's how well we do it and how well the results come out. And, relies as much on me as anybody else in this room or anyone else who's watching on television or anyone else who hasn't even heard about it yet. Okay, thank you. Um, as you can see, we all are in agreement on uh, problems down in the fairgrounds. I think what's, what makes me unique is I'm already on the ground and I've talked to some of the abutters. Um, I've had conversations and, and they feel kind of left out by uh, some of the, the fairground people. Um, as your council at large, I will help to facilitate with, uh, with a uh, openness to uh, start the conversation. Uh, we are in the, the uh, early stages, but we already know what some of the problems are. And we need to move forward and look and see where we can go and how we can access enough um, togetherness to solve this. Because as Bill said, it's a we, program, a we problem and uh, we need to work as a group to solve this. Nothing gets done as a single person. As a single counselor, I won't get it done. It'll be have to be as a we thing. And the, the uh, Ward 3 has been a very active community. I think they will be very active on this issue. Um, and I, I hope to help uh, facilitate that. The next question uh, we'll take from the audience. And uh, just come right up here. I can do it from here. Can't uh, hear you for TV. You need to get up to the television. Sorry. <laughs> you want makeup before you? You're on camera now. You've got the TV. Okay. Yeah. Okay. My name is Leonard Cohen. I'm from uh, Bixby Ford. Um, uh, I, I, I have a simple question to you. Um, one is, what is the actual role of the counselor at large versus just a counselor? And do you have voting privileges? Do you make decisions that are final? Uh, what what is what is your actual role? MG, we'll start with. Uh, that actually might have been nice to have Jesse answer that first since he's been sitting in the role, or Bill to give you some historical perspective. I'm sort of the newbie on that, and I will learn quite specifically what that is next year when I sit in my new seat there. Um, but um, what I think it is is that I understand that the city councilor at large is indeed one of three 
uh, councilors, city councilors that represent everyone in town. And I say that because you have two at-large city councilors, and then you have your own ward councilor. And between the three of those folks who you, you have elected to represent your concerns, the city should be able to address, we should be able to act as a liaison to help you get to the right department or, or, or part of the city that needs to address the concern that you have. Or be a good sounding board to figure out how we can take this up to the next level. How, how, this needs, how your concern needs to be at the table in city council chambers to get addressed. Uh, my understanding, if, if I'm clear about your question, is what is our voting rights? I think we have, we carry a single vote as does every other ward councilor, um, or as, as does every councilor in City Hall Chambers. Um, there's nine councilors, nine city councilors, seven representing wards of each respective ward, and then the councilors at large um, are less focused on one ward, but more on the, the city as a whole. And so you have two councilors devoted to a holistic view of the community and how, how one community's mitigation <coughs> impacts have on other wards and, see, and try to and, and speak up for the whole city for the most part. But you also do represent the individuals within the wards and the individual ward issues. The, as to voting, we are legislators. We're actually the most elemental form of representational government there is. We're, we don't have staff. We cut our edges. You can yell at us while we do it. And we are the most immediate, connectable form of, of representational government there is. The, young, the next thing below us is town meeting where people represent themselves. We're a city that's large enough to qualify and it makes sense, although that may come up in the discussion of the Charter Review. But the fact is, when I say that we legislate, we vote on laws, ordinances, zoning, the budget. Um, we don't draft the budget, but we can draft and start zoning as well. And so, the, and I just realized, and I'm speaking very presumptuously, as if I'm a counselor, I would, I would just say I'll speak in my emeritus status out of that. And that, the, that so this is my favorite form of government, being a representative, being a representative at this level, where actually the people that you impact, you hear from right away. Um, I, I think both the candidates have already spoken, and Jesse will probably back this up, that um, the, you have three counselors. I've, I've said this from the beginning of my campaign. And they should be working uh, together as unison on all the problems within in the wards. Uh, you should have three councils representing each uh, issue that you bring forward. Um, they may not always agree any, with each other, but they should actively be uh, working on, on your uh, problems. Um, we're the last stop gap for citizen representation that the city council is, and so goes the uh, council at large. Um, it's a very important issue, especially the council at large, because you, you uh, Take care of the whole city. Uh, you just don't want to have one ward. You have the whole city, and and in that, I believe that's uh, probably the important uh, issue here, is that uh, as a council at large, you should have the representation throughout the city. With respect to your question about the role of the ward councilor versus the at-large councilor, the ward councilor is supposed to theoretically stay more focused on his or her ward, and the at-large councilor is theoretically supposed to think about the city as a whole. For example, if there were an issue that popped up, or as your at-large counselor, I thought it may not best be the best thing for some in a ward, but best for the whole city and the future of Northampton, I should vote for the whole city and the future of Northampton if that came up. <clears throat> um, the, the counselors, three main roles that we have. Budget screening to match, to make sure that all tax dollars spent match your values and priority, something I've done in my first term. Drafting, sponsoring, and voting on ordinances, that makes sense. Uh, that's, that's another role. And the third role, which is equally as important, is advocacy, to be your advocate. Now, my philosophy is, if any constituent comes to me, no matter what ward, I try to, to deal with whatever the issue is, um, or point them in the right direction. But, and also, earlier in the, in the year, when Ward 3 lost their ward counselor, um, Jerry Budger from the association, asked the at-large counselors to fill that role, Councilor Narquitz and myself. 
So that was another role that we were asked to fill, was to take the place of the ward counselor during that absence where this um, ward didn't have a counselor. So our job during that period was to focus on all the Ward 3 issues, whether it was the fairgrounds, um, truck escape routes, um, <clears throat> trucks not going down uh, through Damon Road and into industrial drive as they should be. We took on the role of Ward counselors for Ward 3 in addition to um, our roles as at-large counselors. So those are the roles of the counselor, those are, role that, those are the things that I've done, and those are the things I'd like to continue to do. For the next round of questions, we'll start with Bill Dwight. Microphone. <laughs> I'm up. How do you intend to vote on the ballot question to repeal the CPA in Northampton and why? It is my intention, with the one vote I got, to vote no on the repeal. And <laughs> Here's the thing about the CPA. The CPA, with a, a, a relatively small investment from this community, has returned over $20 million of reinvestment back into the community. And the, also, there is a panel set up within the community. In fact, you'll have an opportunity to vote for two people on that committee at this, uh, on November 8th as well. Where projects are presented, can be debated and vetted within the community, by the community, and then once again go before the council for final approval where again there's another bite of the apple for review and, and contesting. It is, as far as money goes, if you, the, it is the best investment we have and it is the most <coughs> directly applied to the issues that we have here. Preservation of affordable housing, preservation of open space, recreation and historical preservation. And actually, to be honest, almost every issue that we're talking about, and we'll probably be talking about today, is directly impacted by the possible investments that we can get to the CPA. The other thing is, is that this is a tax, while it is a tax that's based on the value of your house, it is set up so that it actually reduces minimal impacts, particularly on people in need and people, elder, the elderly and the impoverished. And with those levers and, and fail-safes in there, we really couldn't do better. I mean, we've, we've answered, the state is, the Senate's decided that one of the answers is to offset budget gaps by voting in casinos. I like our odds much better with this one. Um, in the last uh, debate, I said that it, would, it was in favor of the, the CPA. What I said was, with reservations, and as, as Oh, come on, that can't be that short. <laughs> um, what I said was, I would look at every issue and look at both sides of the issue, and I've held true to that. Um, I, I've looked at both sides of the coin, and, uh, and I think we've had some good projects. I, I came out and said that the, the farm uh, served a lot of interest, which is what I think the CPA should do. It shouldn't just be focused on, on uh, uh, just singular things. It should be a community, uh, it's a community preservation act. And it means the community. So I think uh, what the reservations I had was, and I went out and listened to the citizens. And I think that's the important aspect. Some are upset about it, but what I did was I created a book here, and I can show it to anybody after this. Since uh, August 18th, I've been walking around with this and giving the correct information. Some of the slides that were shown at the city council meeting, I had in here in August. So I'm looking to do the right thing, look at the issue, and I will say right now, that I do support the CPA. I said it with reservations because I wanted to check the whole situation out. And I think that's what a counselor should do, especially a counselor at large, because you're serving the community at large. Uh, thank you. I support the CPA. $79 on each average tax bill, and $3.8 million have leveraged $24.3 million. And that's good value. Some of those projects are Forbes Library, Lilly Library, the Florence Fields, as Mike, as Mike said, uh, the David Rogel Center, the First Churches, the Academy of Music, things that I think most of us, if not all of us, value, and things that I think are important to all of Northampton. This November, we all have a say in this. Everyone can vote it up or down. Each person will weigh in, and that's good, and that's democratic. And reasonable people can disagree on whether or not it's a good thing. That's what unity is. But I think the CPA is extremely important. I think it's done terrific things for Northampton, and I support it 100%.
and I urge the voters to do so as well. I too intend to fully uh, intend to vote no on the repeal. I think the CPA was a wonderful gift of an opportunity for a community to really find a new way to invest in things that they felt near and dear to their hearts, to their values, to the things that were important to them, to the things that made the community the community that it is. Our landmark buildings in downtown Northampton, the first churches, the Academy of Music, very important to the vitality of our downtown um, community, which is the envy of many communities around the state. We have a wonderful, lively, vibrant downtown, but it's important that the physical plant, the structures, be kept such that they're safe and can be viable buildings. That does Capital money is not easy to come by, so when CPA money became available, that was a wonderful resource and a very clear statement to the community and to other people around the state that these buildings carry with them a lot of value and they are part of our legacy. They are something that we will maintain and endure and preserve for future generations. The Allard Farm, being Allard Farm, critically important, serving a number of stakeholders up there, a number of issues that were at play, and wonderful credit to a community process that took all these disparate interests in the property, pulled it together in a community process, and came out with, a, I think, an absolute home run of a project. But there are physical needs, things that will need to be built up there, and the CPA is a wonderful resource to be able to do that while out while preserving the necessary resources we need to meet our essential services of education, public safety, and infrastructure. I'll take the next question from the audience. Mm -hmm. Would you come up to the microphone, please? My name is Hill Boss, and I'm not up here to be an advocate for the St. Louis Cardinals in the World Series. <laughs> but I've been a Cardinal fan since 1941. Well, anyway, my question concerns the role of the uh, City Council as a legislative branch of the city government and its role in the checks and balance system that's supposed to exist wherever you have a legislature and an executive branch. In general, do you feel that your main job would be to be a checks and balance on the position of the mayor, regardless of who it might end up being? Or Time. would you... Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, um, yes, that's St. Louis Cardinal. I, I think our charter that we have standing says that check and balance in, in motion right now um, as a your counselor at large I, I talked about fiscal responsibility and uh, and scrutinizing the budget um, I've spoke uh, on the DPW I spoke on water rates um, I've been very active as far as being a voice I spoke uh, against the 127 acres that we bought um, reason being I, I thought that was a, a purchase that could have held off and had more citizen input we did two votes in one session with five months to go before we actually had to do a decision. We had till June to do a decision. And I, I think we could have had uh, better input from the citizens to see where we actually wanted to go with that money. That mo most of that money came out of the Enterprise Fund, the uh, Water Sewer Enterprise Fund. That could have done another street. Um, this is just some of the legislative stuff that I think the councilors could have uh, done a little bit better. Um, as your councilor large, these are the things I'm gonna scrutinize. Um, I've, I've talked about other things, the uh, CDBG grant. We pay $100,000 to administer 70. Does that make sense? I don't think so. So as, as a legislative body, I think that the, uh, when I'm in there, I'm going to do the job that I was elected to and be scrutinized, uh, scrutinizing the budget a little bit tighter. I don't have all the answers, but I'll look for some more citizen input. Thank you. Hill, the role of a city councilor in part is to be, um, in the role of the legislature, the city legislature, the council, is to, is to provide checks and balances with respect to the executive branch. That is one of the roles in addition to creating and drafting ordinances, being an advocate, and analyzing and scrutinizing budgets. In our city, I think we can do better with respect to the balance of powers. I think we can create, I think we can reform our government to have greater checks and balances. 
That's what the Charter Review Committee was all about. I served as vice chair of that committee, and through the, through the process, we made recommendations to create a better set of checks and balances between the legislative and executive branches. We made recommendations to have the mayor no longer chair city council. That would create a better separation of powers. We're one of two cities in the Commonwealth that have the mayor chair city council, so it certainly is an anomaly. I think that once that that's changed and the charter is being redrafted right now, and then it'll be a tremendous effort to get that redrafted charter enacted, and I hope to work on that, continue my work with charter reform and governmental reform. I think once that happens, we'll have a, a government that has greater checks and balances, is more fair, more balanced, and more open. Thank you for your question. I do think that the role of city council is to provide checks and balances against the, the uh, executive office, the mayor's office. And I think that that can be a very healthy sort of push and shove type of conversation. Uh, where does the city want to go? And that doesn't have to come just from the mayor's leadership. That needs to come from the city council uh, also. And there needs to be a healthy, engaged, animated, robust discussion about what we, how we spend our time and energy trying to move the city forward. So I appreciate the, the back and forth of it. Um, I am actually very pleased to hear that there's uh, excitement about the charter reform, that there's a committee that, uh, there was a committee last year that worked on it, uh, made some recommendations, but it sounded like that they didn't accomplish as much as they'd hoped last year. So it feels like we're in a new place right now. I think anytime there's a transition in leadership, it really helps people sort of open their eyes and understand new ways of doing. Is there a different way to do this? Is there a better way to accomplish what we want to accomplish here? And how do we put our legislative, our governing structure in place so that it serves the needs of the community? So I'm excited about the charter committee. Um, an announcement, uh, November 15th will be a public forum for the community to participate in the charter review and to also offer their thoughts on that. And I forgot I was supposed to announce that before. Um, the, and, Hill knows as well, he's, he's served in, in, in municipal government uh, in Amherst. And the, we are a checks and balance, that's an aspect of it, and, and it's, it's a critical aspect. At the same time, we're also, this is not to, to prescribe a conflict, because it's not, it's not set up to actually create a conflict. It's supposed to actually obviate a problem if the, if there is too much power being garnered in one in one position in the executive office. We're you know there's an unfortunate moniker for the type of government we are. It's called strong mayor weak council. Um, it, but in as such, it means that we don't draft budgets mostly. That's what that means. I think it's just as important to work with the mayor, and hopefully we're all pulling the boat in the same direction. But it also is just as important, should that, should there be a conflict, should there be a point in which an, a mayor is dominating and, and, and considered, as far as I'm concerned, at cross purposes what I think is best for the city, then that is my job or any of our jobs, if, depending if we're in office, to counter that. And that and also means, I mean, with the Charter Review, hopefully does come. And I'm pretty sure it will come. So more, more powers vested and more responsibility borne by the councilors. Our next question. A major change to the zoning of King Street is currently moving through the city's legal process. How familiar are you with the details of the proposed changes and do you think they should be approved? I'm very familiar with the proposed changes to King Street. I've been following this issue for a long time, and my meetings um, with the Chamber of Commerce and other involved parties started early in 2010. The process has been a long one, and my vision for the future of King Street is one that is more business friendly than it has been in the past, because that is um, a place that's been identified as a really important part of our economic development and really important for job growth. I think that the balance that was tried to, that they tried to achieve was to make it a bit more business friendly but also environmentally friendly. And I think they've done a relatively good job of that. But I think it may need further scrutiny. I agree with the major concepts of their rezoning for King Street. 
but I think that all parties may not have been heard yet. I was at a meeting on this very issue earlier this week. It was with ordinance and the planning board, and there were families with power was out. It's, a, it's an organized group in Northampton who felt like the people from the Jackson Street area had been heard entirely. So I think that it may be a good set of recommendations, but we do need to perhaps expand the process a little more, hear people out a little more, and see if based on what they tell us, there needs to be changes in the policy, and if we meet all the concerns that there are through a good process, I will support the final recommendations. I think the rezoning question on King Street is a wonderful opportunity for us to talk about where are we going as a community. Um, we, I think we have a very strong and uh, valiant uh, planning history here in the, in the community. I, I think it started actually way back with um, Mayor Musanti and uh, Jean Bennell, the planning director there at that time, who really thought, what kind of city could this be? How do I plant the seeds? How do I lay down the, uh, the groundwork that needs to happen for this community really to change and become something new and different? And they did that back there. And through a continual good open planning process over the years, we have continued to reinvent ourselves, to continue to make ourselves fresh and new. And I think that that has really spoken well of us in the region and in the state. I mean, we are known for a community that does new and challenging things. And sometimes we take risks and try things that we're, we hope will work out and don't actually work out the way that we might have intended. But we are smart enough to sort of step back and go back to the drawing table and say, okay, there's bumps in this road, what do we need to do? And I think that that's what we're doing right now with the King Street Zoning. As we do that, I say, let's not just think of what's happening in the here and now, let's think about what we're doing here in the region for the long term. We know the rail corridor comes up, there's talk about the um, commuter rail extending from New Haven up into uh, Hartford and then into Springfield and then north up here through the valley. When that happens, and it will happen, what do we want our King Street area that lines along that track to look like? And I think those thoughts have to be in our mind now as we're looking 10, 15 years down the line, how are we going to get ourselves out of these cars more into more sustainable transportation modes and to really capitalize on that wonderful proximity we have to the rail, trip, the rail line that goes north and south here. River Valley Market, super big Y. Um, CVS, two Leah dealerships, Walgreens, Dave Soda and Pet Food City. Those were all new structures that were built, all new businesses that were built from them and qualified for adding to the general fund. It didn't get us out of trouble. I think the principal concern is, is what kind of development we're going to get and what type of development we want. And I was one of the original drafters along with Councilor Gieslin and Councilor Rita Blyman that came up with the zoning, oops, I'll speak louder, <laughs> came up with the zoning that, uh, that exists today. And when we, when we presented that, we said there is not a period at the end of this, there's a comma. That means that it should, the zoning should reflect a continuum and adjust to the time and adjust to the circumstances. My principal concern, uh, Jesse mentioned it, was uh, these days, I actually think the process for this has been great, by the way. I think the process for the zoning that's being proposed has been excellent. It's about two years of uh, community input, as was our process originally back in the early 2000s. But they, the, we're talking about a corridor, a corridor that doesn't have doors to its, some of its abutters. It's, it will be easier for people to travel from Brattleboro to go to a shop in Northampton than it would be for people who live 100 yards away up at Hampshire Heights, Hathaway Farms, the Barrett Street Apartments, River Run Apartments, they can't even get, they can't get out of their complex. They are literally relegated to an island. And there is a cause and effect that we have to be conscious of as we proceed forward with these zoning and, as, and we have to actively go and pursue the input of those communities. We can't just rely on the fact that we haven't heard from them. We actually have to seek them out. I've, I've talked, I don't, can, can you hear me? No, I'll speak up too. Um, I've talked about the King Street uh, right from the beginning. I think it was February I started talking about uh, King Street. I think the process was far overdue. I think that's where 
where we are short. Um, I think some good things have come down down the road, and, and I was at the meeting last night when some of the, the uh, changes and modifications came up. I think we're headed in the right direction. There's a buffer zone. It's going to look a lot better. Um, your Ward 3 counselor uh, weighed in quite a bit and got uh, some of those modifications done, so he should uh, get some kudos for that. Uh, I think that not just King Street, but we need to look at the city as a whole. Florence is hurting also. So I think what we do with King Street, we can transfer over to, to uh, some of the other line areas. Um, if you look at the old Bay State Wire, it's just sitting there. There's trees growing out, out, out of the building. So when we look at King Street, we need to apply that to the rest of the city also. I think King Street can be the model. Uh, and I think the citizens' input is the crucial part here. Um, as you heard, Hampshire Height uh, residents came down and, and uh, talked to uh, some of the counselors. I think Maureen Carney had a, a meeting with them, with uh, Families with Power. And uh, I think Bill was there. And uh, so what was put in place was to actually listen to the citizens and see what their concerns were. And uh, some of the modifications done were to address those things. So I think we're headed in the right direction. I, I, my concern was why did it take so long? Question from the audience. How about over this side? Somebody from over here? Someone's had their hand up all three times over there. Oh, okay. The post. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Who said that? <laughs> Next time I won't wear red. Um, Sue Timberlake, uh, sorry I have to read this question, but every year Northampton runs short on water. And, uh, you know, it's a very valuable commodity. Companies are going all over the world trying to buy water rights. And here we are in Northampton. We have one very large user of water. I calculate, and the numbers are hard to get. 7.3% of Northampton's water goes to one company. And I think they may have an entitlement to even more in the future. They're um, doubling their size, I think. So, um, and the other thing is that in Northampton, contracts tend to have a very big loophole in them that you could drive a truck through. So here's the question. If you are in a leadership position, what would you have done differently with the Coca-Cola contract? And if you're not currently in a leadership position, what would you do differently in the future? Um, I want to share with us, uh, the community that Northampton really has quite an abundance resource of water. Uh, we have a very wonderful uh, reservoir system. Uh, the water restrictions that people have been living through the last couple of years are not so much tied to the supply that's in our reservoir system, but they are tied to the benchmark that the state uh, has set in terms of deciding uh, river flow. So when we're putting out the call that there is a water restriction in Northampton, it's because the water flow in the Mill River is lower than uh, a benchmark that the state has set, even though our reservoirs might be filled to the, to the brim. I think that we are extraordinarily blessed to have the resource, the water resources that we have. We have those now because our forefathers, a hundred years ago, planned for some terrific, terrific reservoirs. We talked about this recently at the Board of Public Works. What we do know is, is that we have a large manufacturer who's a large uh, industrial user of water who provides some pretty important jobs here and who's expanding here and expanding jobs here uh, that is pretty important to our community. <coughs> so I, I'm a big believer that you take a look around in your community, you take a look at your assets, and you try to capitalize on those assets for the best value for the community. And I think that the Coca-Cola company is a long-term, solid uh, part of our community. It's part of our manufacturing history here. It's here. It provides very important jobs, uh, tax revenue, uh, and yes, it is expanding and has the possibility to draw more water, but I believe that that is something that we should be positive about. I will say I do want them to um, pay for their fair share of any sort of infrastructure improvement that needs to happen, but we are we are partners with them because they we we rely on them for tax revenue, we rely on them to provide jobs for our community, they rely on us to provide water. Well, I just learned something. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I didn't realize that it was tied to the state in that. Thank you. <laughs> because otherwise, if I had started that question, I would have, I would have flailed. Um, actually, on a, on a, meta, on a meta, meta perspective, what concerns me is the privatization of water. The co-opting of water systems by private companies, not for consumption, but for distribution. Um, and actually, Coca-Cola is doing that to some degree. It, the irony, of course, is we're paying far more per gallon for water than we are for gasoline. 
And cities like Atlanta have essentially ceded all their water rights, and they're no longer controlled by the municipalities. And consequently, they, when things get a little dicey, when the water's been sold far, far beyond, there is no water available to that community. I, that isn't happening here. I think, but, but the fact remains is that if, you know, as a council or not, whether I'm in power or not, my principal concern and constant concern is giving up municipal water systems for, for, and, and, in, and being replaced by private water systems that I have to pay for, and which maybe I can afford but somebody else may not. So, I, I, you know, I'm not sure that's an answer to your question, but I, I, and I actually, and I also agree, I mean, Coca-Cola is a critical asset uh, here to the community. We, when we talk about all the stresses that we're experiencing, we need the revenue and the jobs that they generate. And, you know, the concern, of course, is at what point do you make a moral choice between those two things? I don't think Coca-Cola breaks the standard of, of evil empire that I would object to. Um, we're all in agreement uh, privatization and uh, the usage of, of Coke uh, citizens are very concerned and maybe they don't have all the information and uh, we maybe need to do a, a better outreach for the, the citizens on what ex actually Coke does. Um, some of the things as council at large, I haven't heard anything about a contingency plan if the water level does go low. Will Coke abate some of their, um, their water usage as we have to do? That would be one question. Um, another thing would be, uh, do, do we do a fee, a dif differential fee, to uh, accommodate uh, the, that usage? Um, uh, those are some of the questions I, I think that should be put out there. I think that the citizens should be involved in this, uh, this process. It, it is our community. Coke is, is a, a part of it, an integral part of it. It does provide some, some jobs. But in the long run, the city has to look at its water resources and make judgments based on that and Coke has to be a partner at the table. I heard, I heard several issues raised in that. First of all, uh, unfortunately we can't raise the water rates on Coke alone. We'd have to do it you know, uniformly throughout the entire city. We did give Coca-Cola a TIF, which is a tax increment financing plan, which means that for a period of time they got a tax break on their new growth, the build that the new growth of their company. So it was for uh, just for the new growth and for a limited time. And that did not sit well with me. And the reason why is because I don't want to give Coke a tax break. I want to give small businesses downtown a tax break. I want to give small businesses in Florence a tax break. But the reason why we did it was because of the jobs. And the job growth exceeded our expectations and it is important for economic development in Northampton. It is important for jobs in Northampton. I want people who want to live here to be able to live here. That was a tough decision. As a, as a decision maker, that's what I have to do. I've made the tough decisions. But also, I'd like to point out my record of protecting water. I heard it brought up earlier that we bought a, a, a piece of land for $700,000 in Whaley to protect our water supply. Now that was uh, based on appraisal from FSI, which everyone agreed was a reputable appraiser. And it may have seemed like a large amount of money, but that $700,000 will go to protecting the water supply for the future generations of this city. I have a record of protecting water. I also voted to close the landfill because two years ago when I was campaigning, I promised that I would protect the public health and the environment. That landfill is in a water supply protection district over an aquifer. So I have a record of, of protecting water, and I will continue to do that if reelected. Thank you. How are we for time, Bob? Oh, okay. uh, this next question is about money. Uh, the city is struggling with significant budgetary issues. Does the city of Northampton have a spending problem or a revenue problem? Can additional savings be found in the municipal budget? Are tax overrides a good long-term solution? How do you stand on the proposed local option meals and hotel taxes? Five questions. <laughs> we, have, we do have a revenue problem. We are not alone. We're part of a global problem. 
that and we're, we're experiencing the same thing that's manifesting itself in communities throughout the world and particularly in the Northeast. And in fact, as such, we, we're better off than most communities. Casting is a spending problem. I think we, have, we clearly are still going to have to make spending choices. We're going to have to make hard spending choices. We already have. Um, when you complain about the road that you're driving on, or you're complaining about the, the amount of kids in, your, in the classroom that your child goes to, those are direct results of tough spending decisions that have been made. <laughs> uh, okay, I thought we were we were mic'd again. I'm sorry. The uh, so so the now I am mic'd. I'll stop yelling. <laughs> so, no, but the, the so and no overrides are not a, a they're they're a budget reaction. They're a budget reaction to a system known as Proposition Two and a Half. Proposition Two and a Half, as you all know, we've lived under it for quite some time now. Puts a two and a half cap, 2.5% increase cap on expanding our general fund. That has created this profound dysfunctional tax system in this state. We, as a result, what we have is where the state has abrogated and, and is passed up on its responsibility to collect a fair progressive income tax and then dumps it down in the cities and the towns where they have to uh, impose a, a, a a regressive uh, property tax. So yeah, we're going to have we're and we're going to continue because of the global issues, because of the the budget limitations, and to ever, we're going to continue to have these fights and arguments. And what, the best way to address it is to work in a unified fashion and address it and realize that the objective is to do what's best for the city ultimately throughout the entire city. Our budget is based on assumption, and that's a scary thing. Um, we assume that we will collect the monies for the parking fees. We assume we'll get the, the right amount of monies down the road from the state. Anything, anything could turn that uh, uh, upside down. Um, we have to be cognizant of that fact continuously. We have to uh, look forward in our, our budgeting. Um, and looking at the budget, I, I would have be hard-pressed to vote for any two and a half. I would really have to weigh out the, the option and see if it was really good for the community. Um, uh, it's it's a hard choice. It's a it's something that that would uh, sit uh, very hard with me. And looking at the the budget as itself, we do have a revenue problem. We already know. We look at King Street, and we know we have a revenue problem coming in. But what are we going to do? And I think we're heading in the right direction to uh, make more revenues come in. We have to be more business friendly, not just in King Street, throughout the city. Um, the restaurants uh, took a very big hit. They they made an accommodation to uh, their business, they lower their prices. Uh, it's something that they have to look at. Is working in Big Y, they have plans, but every year they do a reassessment of the plan and see if it fits uh, their needs. The city should do the same thing in a business sense. We always have a social aspect, but we should be thinking like a business as far as revenues and expenditures. Um, can we look at the, the, uh, all the, uh, the uh, departments and do something a little different? Can we combine departments? In, as a cost savings. Can we uh, look at uh, possibly uh, vehicles? Are, are, are vehicles going home that shouldn't be going home? It, it's just things to look at and I think citizen input uh, and ideas from the community. We have such a broad range of professionals in here and I think they, we could tax them for some of their ideas in uh, open forums. Northampton has a revenue problem. If we look at what's happened throughout the last decade, the state has given us less and less and we've had to make up for that through property taxes. And the federal government is off fighting wars we don't need and can't afford and leaving us to raise our own revenues here at home. Some of the things we can do. We can collaborate within departments. We can regionalize, meaning we can look to other cities and towns and try to collaborate with them for the same resources, but only if those resources are of the same quality. Proposition 2.5 did not pass in the four western, Massachusetts, four western counties of Massachusetts. But it did throughout the rest of the state, so that's the law. That's democracy. But my problem with Proposition 2.5 is that it does not let us keep up with inflation. And, and further, Proposition 2.5 is it's a, it's, a tax, it's, a, it's a limit on property taxation. And I think that it should be either eliminated or reformed. So at a very, very minimum, it allows us to keep up with inflation. The hotel and meals tax. I personally thought it was the wrong time to institute that particular 
tax on the hotels, and but that's a thing of the past. I wasn't on the council at that time, and it was a, a revenue generator. And fortunately, I think that our our restaurants and hotels are still doing relatively well, despite the fact that they have this additional tax. So I'm thankful that it hasn't been too much of a burden. I don't think. I also support. I'm, pro I'm progressive, and I support a progressive state income tax because I don't think a flat tax is as fair. And I think a progressive income tax will go further to achieve more equality. I also support the Invest in Our Communities Act, which will tax corporations at a greater amount, and they can continue and they can begin to pay the the amounts that they should be paying rather than getting breaks. The question is whether or not we have a spending problem and a revenue problem in Northampton, and the answer is yes. I believe we have a revenue problem, and as you've heard from my other. Uh, colleagues here, that I think that it is grounded in what Proposition Two and a Half started a number of years ago. I think the city of Northampton has been extraordinarily creative in responding to the challenges that Proposition Two and a Half dropped in our lap. Yes, costs go up faster than we're able to raise revenues with our property taxes, but we've taken a very, I think, aggressive and progressive approach of looking at what are our essential services and those that are essential, where. Where, if necessary, can we support fees to uh, support the operation of that, that, op that operation? Many things that used to, we used to do at no cost, we now have a fee structure for. We now regionalize with a number of services. I'm, I, and I, I like to point out what we've done with our veterans agent, which I think is really a wonderful model. How can we take a look at essential services that we want to provide to our, commu our community and to work with our neighboring, neighboring cities and towns to make sure that a high quality service is provided and that we're sharing a cost of a, of a specialized area. I think the veterans agent that we've done here in the Valley is a great model of that. But I'll also say that some of the other reasons that we've been able to tap some of the external revenue, some of the grants that we've been able to receive to do things in Northampton, is because we have made plans. We have laid down the groundwork. We, are, we have made good plans on, on the Jackson Street site, on the Jackson Street project, we got that money to do that project because we were shovel ready when that stimulus money came. So I want to speak to the importance about doing the groundwork, doing the planning process, laying down the plans so that when these opportunities come up, we are ready to take advantage of that. And I think that's going to become more and more critical over the next couple of years, especially as we look at streets, sidewalks, all that infrastructure uh, that we have that has not had the attention that it needs, that really needs to be um, replaced. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Fred got a different sound. We'll move on to the closing statements now, and each candidate will have, <coughs> excuse me, will have one minute for a closing statement. And why don't we reverse the order, uh, Michael, and start with you. Okay. Right. Again, I would like to thank the Ward 3 Association for sponsoring tonight's debate. Recent events on the national and state level have highlighted U.S. citizens' discontent with their elected officials. Northampton residents have recently echoed similar concerns regarding city government, decisions in an atmosphere of being ignored. The heart of Northampton is, is its citizens, and my candidacy has been built on the willingness to listen to those citizens of Northampton. In doing so, I have not only been active in this ward, but throughout the city. I have shown that I will challenge decisions that I believe could have been better served by more citizen input. One of these decisions was the purchase of 127 acres with two votes in one council meeting, allowing for no further citizen input. The city had more than five months to make this decision. I, open, I openly offered suggestions regarding water increases in the DPW building. I believe that the transparency the citizens are so desperate for can be achieved by making sure the best practices we created are filed by all government ent entities. Is that it? Thank you very much, and I hope to get your vote on November 8th. I grew up in Hoyoke. I've, I've lived here in Northampton for 25 years, and I'm a seasoned veteran of public service. And I served as a counselor for Ward 1 for eight years, as I said, and I continued my civic engagement for five years on WHMP, hosting a local issues radio show. I worked downtown at Pleasant Street Video, the former J.A. Tepper's building, for 25 years. And I... I want to say that I'm not running against someone or something. I'm running for something. And I'm, I'm running to serve the people of the, the North, people of Northampton call home as their facilitator, 
the mediator and their liaison. And that's to the government that, that serves us all. So we've conquered the difficult uh, problems and when we've worked cooperatively and as this neighborhood association has proven several times, as I said, I appreciate the opportunity to speak today. I also would appreciate very much your vote and be honored by it if you would give me one of your two council votes on November 8th. Thank you. <laughs> I want to thank you for having the opportunity to be here this evening to share with you my thoughts of the questions that you put forth. Um, I want, I hope you walk away from this evening feeling like you have four very solid choices to make, and when you step into the voting booth, you get to push two levers. I think that's how it works, right? Uh, you connect, connect two, two lines. <laughs> <laughs> this neighborhood, this neighborhood, more than any other neighborhood in Northampton, knows what a caring and compassionate community we live in. We know that when a, an issue comes up, we can all come together, resolve it, work together, respond, help each other out, and push ourselves forward. And I hope that you will see that that's what's in my leadership. That I hope to be a fresh and independent voice in City Council. Yes, I've never sat in the City Council. Uh, city Council Chambers as a City Councilor, but I have brought a lot, I bring a lot of experience as a, a child who grew up here who came back here uh, and a, a person who works very actively in the community every day to make this place a better place, to have it play, be a place that we're all proud to call home and that we leave for the future generations a legacy so that years from now when those City Councilors are sitting up here they're saying thank goodness for what our City Councilors and our leadership did back in the early 2000s, and now what a, community, what a beautiful community we continue to have. Thank you. I want to thank all the sponsors, all of Ward 3, and all of you here tonight for taking part in your democracy. I have a vision for the future of Northampton, and in my next term, I'd like to address some of these important issues. Drafting and adopting a new charter that will, that will facilitate a more transparent, fair, and open government. <coughs> Addressing our failing infrastructure, including roads, sewers, and drainage systems, continued advocacy for more school funding so that we continue to have strong public education that's of a, of a high quality. Those are some of the things I'd like to do if you re-elect me, and I have a history of delivering on my promises. Public service is very important, and I'd like to thank all the candidates up here tonight. We will have a new mayor this year, and I'd like to be re-elected as the experienced at-large council candidate, along with a new one. It's an honor to serve you all, and I'd like to be reelected. Re -elected. And I'd like to ask each and every one of you for one of your two votes for Adelaide City Councilor on November 8th. Thank you. Why don't we take about a five-minute break? Stretch our